Like the plaintiff's complaint, you'll need to give a short recitation of the reasons why you think the plaintiff is wrong. You should be detailed and specific, and you should provide facts. Here's a correctly filled out answer. This would be Jane Smith responding. So she admits that they entered into a contract and um, that the widgets were delivered, but they were delivered untimely, there weren't enough delivered, and also they were defective. And she corrects him in saying she didn't make any promises as an individual, because if you'll recall, he sued her as an individual and as a company. And she's stating there, I didn't make any promises as an individual, only as an agent to the company, so I shouldn't be named as an individual defendant in this case. And this is an incorrectly filled out answer, just one sentence. There were widgets delivered, but they weren't what I asked for, and also they were late. So not enough detail there. When you file your answer, you may also file a counterclaim. Counterclaims must be within the jurisdiction of the small claims court, so they cannot exceed $7,500. They must arise out of the same transaction or events as the plaintiff's claim, so they can't be entirely unrelated to what the plaintiff is suing on. They cannot require adding more parties, and they cannot be the subject of another pending action. So if you've already sued on those facts, you cannot bring a counterclaim on those facts. And if a counterclaim is not raised, it's waived, so you may not bring it again. If a counterclaim is in excess of the small claims court jurisdiction, it will be transferred to county court. And if a counterclaim is not filed seven days before the trial, the trial may be continued. So it's in your interest to get that counterclaim in prior to seven days before trial. In filling out the counterclaim form, this is once again page two of the complaint, you'll need to give a short recitation of the situation, just as the plaintiff did. You should be specific, itemize the amounts owed, and state the applicable legal theory. Once again, breach of contract, security deposit dispute, civil theft, etc. And if your claim is based on the enforcement of a restrictive covenant or security deposit dispute, then you'll need to include the address of the property or residence that gives rise to the dispute. Then there are some check boxes. Uh, the amount of the counterclaim does not exceed $7,500. The amount exceeds $7,500, but you will accept $7,500. The amount exceeds and you would like to transfer to county court, which is limited to $15,000, or district court, which has no limitation. Whether you're an attorney, and then you should note that you do not need to serve the answer and or counterclaim, but you must assert that you mailed a copy to the plaintiff at the address that was provided in the complaint. So here are some samples of a correctly filled out counterclaim and an incorrectly filled out counterclaim. This is correctly filled out. It says, because of plaintiff's failure to deliver the widgets on time, Jane Smith LLC lost a contract with another company that, for products that required the widgets. And Jane Smith is seeking damages of $1,000 that were caused by John Doe's failure to meet the contract. This one is incorrectly filled out. It just says, I lost $1,000 on another contract because I got the wrong widgets. So there's not enough information, there are no dates, etc. The defendant's fees differ depending on um, the amount of the plaintiff's claim and then also whether the defendant files a counterclaim. And once again, the fees can be found on the court's website at forms and then filing fees. And as with the person filing the claim, you may ask for a fee waiver if you qualify as indigent. That's forms 205 and 206, which are available online. Just a reminder regarding settlement, you should remember that at any time in the process, either party can initiate settlement discussions. And if you reach an agreement with the other party before the hearing date, then you should document it in writing, have each side sign it, and present that information to the clerk of the court so the case can be dismissed. If you don't present the settlement agreement to the court, if you're a plaintiff and the defendant shows up to trial and you do not, your case will be dismissed. And if you're a defendant and the plaintiff shows up to trial and you do not, the court will enter a default judgment against you. And if you can't prove the case is settled, then you may not be able to set the default judgment aside. So it's crucial that you get the settlement agreement in writing and present it to the court.